If you've ever spent half an hour flicking through movies on Netflix without being able to decide what you want to watch, you'll be well aware of the crippling problem of too much choice. But compared to being a photographer, that's easy. Most photographers who shoot for their own enjoyment look to convey the pleasure of their surroundings in the photos they take. Usually the first thing they do with their shiny new camera is rush off to a much loved location, point their lens at their favorite part, and then wonder what went wrong. The image captured in the viewfinder shares nothing of the joy they feel when simply looking at the same view with the naked eye. Why is this? Well, it's because the camera is a dumb beast. And no matter how much technical control you have over it, there's still one more element you need. And it's not skill, years of experience, the artist's eye, or any of the other esoteric nonsense someone who couldn't explain to you how to take a great shot try to fob you off with. There is no magic trick, secret source, or superior skill you need that you don't already possess. All you need to do is look and think. And today, we're leaving the kitchen, Yahoo! it's sunny now, and going to several spots in the outside world where I'll show you just how not to be overwhelmed with some kind of frenzied inertia by the staggering beauty or complexity of your surroundings. I'll also show you how to pick the best shot when the location is not what you expected. Today, you learn what the real magic of photography is, and that's putting a little piece of you into the equation. And they're not just fancy $10 words either. Let me show you. Landscape <laughs> or cityscape photography is one of the best ways to learn photography. For a start, your subject doesn't move, so you don't have to worry about taking your time and being patient learning new skills. I teach a beginner's photography course here in Brighton, and every third lesson I take my students out into the field. One of the locations we visit is here, and the reason I bring them here is that there are so many different photographic opportunities that it's easy to become overwhelmed as to what you should take a photograph of. That's the point of coming here. I show you how you can come into a place like this, see so many opportunities for a photo, and I teach you how to narrow it down. What I'm going to do now is take you to all of the locations that we visit in this small area and tell you effectively what I tell my students, which is how to assess a situation, how to assess a scene and work out what it is that intrigues you and exactly what it is you should be taking a photograph of. It's difficult when you start, but you'll soon get used to the experience. One of the most important things that you should do when you first arrive at a location is actually leave your camera in its bag. Don't take the camera out straight away and start snapping. Because what will happen is you'll spend half an hour snapping in one place, put the camera back in the bag, take a walk around the corner and see something absolutely wonderful that you should have taken a shot off first. So the first thing when you arrive is don't rush to take pictures. Instead, if you're in a big location like this, take a good walk around, have a look around and see what intrigues you. I don't want you to get too specific and hung up on this, but when I say see what intrigues you, I mean, if you're walking over to a scene and you see two very similar scenes, both of which are stunningly beautiful, but one draws you more than another and you can't quite put your finger on why, don't worry about the why. Just make a note that that's the place that intrigued you more, because what you're going to do is walk around, look at a lot of places, and then come back to the ones that intrigued you most and work out why then. So you finally worked out what it is you want to take a photograph of. You've gone back to the intriguing location. I'm, for example, always intrigued by this West Beach Cafe design up here. It's a very Art Deco 30 style. I really like it. So when I come here, that's what my eye is always drawn to. And then what you think is, well, what shutter speed should I use? What lens should I put on it? Do I want to get close up? Do I want to get far away? It's not going anywhere. And if you've allowed yourself plenty of time, which you should do, then just take all the shots that you can think that you want to take. Don't rush. Think about how you want to frame the image and then just take your time, relax and take all the shots you want. When you get them back on your computer, you're going to see which ones worked and which ones didn't. And that way you're going to start to carve out what's your own style. And what we're going to do first is talk about the difference between recording an image versus composing an image. If you look at this image of uh, the City of Arts and Sciences in Valencia, there's a real problem with it. The problem being is that you can't tell A, what these things are, and B, what size or scale they are. 
Take a guess before I show you another picture. The reason why the picture below is better than the picture above is because there's a person in it to give you a sense of scale. Plus, the notion of a repeating pattern is emphasized by using a technique known as lens compression. This is where you use a 300mm lens, which is usually one you would use for zooming in on a subject from far away, and this gives a compressed effect to all those shells that you see in the scene. With this lower picture, you get a better sense of the repeating pattern, how big it is, and how long it goes on for, and you get a sense of scale as to what size they are by having a person included in the shot. None of this is apparent from the top picture. This is a picture of a waterfall in West Burton. Absolutely nothing wrong with the picture. In fact, there's nothing wrong with any of these first pictures I'm going to show you. But the fact is that it's just a rather plain, ordinary shot. The waterfall in West Burton is in a dark and rather shaded area. And it has a wonderfully spooky feel. If you go in there on a hot summer's day, the temperature instantly drops as you go in because of this covering of the trees, which keeps the temperature cool inside, along with the breezes that flow and blow the cool air off the water. This photograph, although absolutely technically fine, doesn't evoke any of that atmosphere, which is why I did this. Now, I talked about how this picture was taken in the last video, so I'm not going to run through it again, but the bullet points are that it's a slow shutter speed and a narrow aperture to keep it dark and mysterious. The last picture again is in the City of Arts and Sciences in Valencia, but the point is there's no sense of scale. That building actually has five theatres inside it, but you get no sense of how big it is because there's no architecture nearby to give you a, an additional sense of scale. The buildings in the background, for example, are too far away. Now, what I did was I took a completely different perspective on this. I included people in the shot again, which gives you a sense of scale. And I used a technique called breaking the frame. Your instinct when you see an object like this or a piece of architecture like this is to move as far back as you can to get the whole thing in shot. It's actually the wrong instinct because you just end up with a rather dull, bland shot. What you should do is try and compose your image as such that it shows how vast this thing is. I haven't got the whole thing in, but you can see this huge fish-like structure in the background and these two tiny people in the foreground. There are lots and lots of compositional techniques you can use, but when you're out in the field the first time, I'm just going to get you to concentrate on three or four of them. The first one is the rule of thirds, and like all the rules that I'm about to quote you, they're not so much rules, more a guideline. Most people know about the rule of thirds because they're told that when you take a photograph, what you should do is place a subject on the intersection of the lines. This is nonsense. You can do that and you will get a pleasing image, but it's actually much better to use the rule of thirds to compose your image within the frame. Let's look at this picture on the left-hand side, first of all, from a perspective of the rule of thirds. Starting in the middle, the peak of the sand dunes is in the top centre of the frame. On the left, it sweeps away to the left, and on the right, it sweeps to the right, with, in the middle frame, the additional interest of a person. As you can see horizontally, the rule of thirds is used quite strongly that in all of the bottom sections you have the first sand dune, in all of the middle sections you have the second sand dune, and in all of the top section you have the blue sky. If you look at the person on the right hand side, the rule of thirds is used differently there. I've blocked out two thirds of the frame using the person's body, and I've used a shallow aperture to get a blurred background so you get a sense of depth. The bear is bang in the middle of the frame. Normally, as a golden rule, you don't put anything in the middle of the frame. But I've used the rule of thirds here to block out two parts of the frame with the body and one frame with the arm and the depth in the background. Another way of creating a feeling of depth in a subject is to put a foreground subject in sharp focus and blur the background. Here you can see a photograph taken by Tom Cummins, who has put the focus on the stones and gravel in the front of the frame, but you can see that there's areas of interest going on in the back. There's a lot more going on in this frame too, but save that for another time. This is a shot I took in Yosemite National Park, and although it looks like just a two-piece shot, i.e. the lake and the mountains in the background, this area in the lower third of the frame actually adheres to the rule of thirds. 
so that you break the subject into three areas, a sharply focused area right in the bottom, uh, then you have a midsection of more of the lake and a top section of the mountains, but you also use this thing of blocking out two thirds of the frame of the lake, one with the mountain and a foreground object as well. You can combine different techniques to get a more interesting shot. This composition uses two techniques. It puts a foreground object that draws your eye at the front of the frame, i.e. the carousel on the right hand side. It uses the rule of thirds in that the carousel takes up the right hand third of the frame and uh, the white ferris wheel actually takes up the left two thirds of the frame. Uh, so you can see it like that. It also uses something that we're going to talk about called leading lines, uh, where the leading lines take your eye to a different area of the photograph. I don't like this photograph myself because I feel that the leading lines don't actually lead anywhere. And for me, if your leading lines lead nowhere, it's a bit like taking a disappointing journey. As you can see on this picture, I've used the leading lines of the train to take your eye to the silhouette of the man who's standing in the only bright part of the frame. Leading lines are a great way to draw a person's attention to a small part of the frame that they might otherwise overlook. As I say, the ferris wheel with the leading lines on it went nowhere, but the leading lines of this train actually take you to the man standing there as well. It's important when you use techniques like this that what you do is realise that you're making somebody's eye move over a picture and through a picture. You're taking them sort of on a journey and leading lines are one of the best ways to do this. Likewise, if we look at this picture taken at the Great Wall of China, the leading lines aren't immediately apparent, but of course what, you, what your eyes tend to do is follow the wall, which results in you ending up at these two red balloons. And of course the bright red against the green calls the eye to it. When you get a location like this, for example, it's very easy just to stand and take what I call the postcard shot, which is a shot where you literally just stand in front of it and get the whole thing. However, the whole thing is made up of lots of really interesting angles. After all, it's something we're used to seeing, a house, but it's upside down. That means that the light falls on it in different ways. All the angles are different to how you are used to seeing them. So probably the best thing to do if you're taking a photograph of something like that is not so much just take the wide shot, because you can do that on your mobile phone, but actually go in and start examining the angles. Something like this will be intriguing simply by its nature. And the thing to do is to get in there, work out what aspects of it are most intriguing to you, and actually crop in and focus on those. What I'm gonna do is actually show you pictures that my students took here, not me, because as a teacher, you should be proud of the pictures your students take, and if they're not taking good pictures, then you're not really a very good teacher, are you? I say that safe in the knowledge that I know I'm gonna show you some absolutely top-notch pictures. yourself out to a local spot that you know well is a really good way to start honing your photographic eye. In the next video I'm going to tell you how I came to take this photo while on holiday in San Diego last autumn. I'm going to cover how I found the right station out of the 20 or so on the beach, how I picked the angle, why I decided to choose a certain lens, the difficulties I encountered on the day and how I overcame them and how I took the final shot. In the video after that, I'll talk about how I chose to edit the image, based largely on how I imagined it looking when I first had the idea for the shot. If you're enjoying these videos, please leave a comment below. See you next time.